beats the hell out of me. It just doesn't show up for work one day. Well, her apartment's all in order. Emma Spool was as regular as clockwork. I just hope nothing serious happened to the old girl. You mean like Norman Bates? Local branch of the Audubon Society? My hobby, stuffing things. A lot of people think that they can't be rehabilitated and shouldn't be allowed back on the streets, that there shouldn't be an insanity defense. It's always there, throbbing inside you. Even the initials on her suitcase. M.C. Marion Crane. Another of your cheap erotic delusions out of your cheap erotic imagination. God, don't tell me you're one of those guys who farts, rolls over, and then goes to sleep. I picked you up in a bar after one lousy drink. What, do you want to get married? Stupid bitch! You could have been coming instead of going. She's a nice girl. She's a whore. But get that whore out of my house. Watch the guitar. from April Fool's Day and Destroy Her, and you are listening to Hysteria. Continue. <laughs> Hysteria continues. Bye, you guys. And indeed you are. Welcome back to the Hysteria Continues. This is episode 293, and we're going back to the Bates Motel for Psycho 3. Um, Eric, uh, this is your pick, isn't it, I believe? It is indeed, yes. Ooh. I have, a, I have a, a shocking confession to make when we come to the film. You've never seen it before? I've never seen it before. <gasps> I only realised when I watched it this morning that I had never seen it before. Isn't it funny that sometimes you just presume you watch movies? And I've seen Psycho 4 at the beginning, and I've seen, obviously seen the, first, uh, the original Psycho and Psycho 2 many times, and I just presumed I'd seen Psycho 3. But watching it, it's a first-time view for me. Oh, interesting. Interesting, yes. And um, Joseph, how are you doing this fine morning? Oh, I uh, I can't complain, I suppose. Okay, well, if that's the best it's going to be. I don't want to complain, <laughs> Okay, is what I'm trying to say. I want, I want this to be a happy episode. Yeah, it'll be a happy episode. Apart from it's slightly, not a sad episode, but we're missing young Nathan because he is um, ill in bed with a bug of some kind. So um, because of our schedule, we've decided to press ahead. So hopefully Nathan can drop something. His pants. Oh, he's not going to miss. He's not going to miss the next episode, considering what it is. There's no way he'll miss it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Nathan will be back uh, with us the next episode, and hopefully he'll drop his thoughts on Psycho Three. Um, so, uh, but yes. So we're going to be getting onto uh, onto that a little bit later. But before we do, should we have a little chat about what we've been watching recently? And I think there is one film. I don't know if. Or you guys managed to catch it. I know, Joseph, you were going to try and catch Totally Killer, the new Amazon Amazon Studios uh, time travel slasher, which I know you were quite excited for. Yeah, Did you manage to catch it in the end? Well, um, if you want to go ahead and talk about it now, we can. However, um, I, I watched the first half of the film and I fell asleep, not because I was bored, but because I was just extremely tired. Um, But what I saw of it, you know, I liked um, maybe it wasn't going in the direction that I thought it would. But, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, I'm interested to see how it pans out. So um, if you guys want to talk about it, just kind of go light on spoilers. Of course, the butler did it. No, um, (gasps) Eric, Eric, did you watch it? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It, It's the film it reminded me most of would be, and this is an obvious touchstone, I suppose, is um, Happy Birthday. No, no, Happy Death Day. Sorry. Um, was the film it, uh, kind of the glossy sci-fi leaning um, uh, slasher movie again like with this one it plays better as a comedy than it does as a slasher movie the I mean there is plenty of slasher action as such in the film but for me my favourite parts of it were the time travel aspect so if you haven't heard the plot it's about a girl whose mother is murdered and she, her best friend just happens to invent a time machine that's built into this photo booth for some reason. And um, she travels back to 1987 to try and stop the killer uh, during his initial killing spree back then. So the, the best parts for me about the film is where she goes back in time 35 years and finds that things like health and safety don't exist in 1987 or things like, um, uh, you know, sexism and and 
racism and that are kind of rife back then. There's a, a great scene where she turns up at the, at the school that she, and she has to sort of make up an excuse as to why she should enroll there. And the receptionist just says, oh, yeah, here, just fill in this form or here's your timetable, she says. And, you know, there's no kind of background checks on her or anything because that's the way things worked in the 80s. And so all that kind of, kind of fish out of water stuff I thought worked very well. Um, in terms of a slasher film, I mean, its slasher element is as potent as it is in Happy Death Day to Me. So if you found Happy Death Day to Me, no, it's not called Happy Death Day to Me. It's called Happy Death Day, isn't it? Um, if you found the slasher element in that film to be a bit light for your liking, then you probably won't enjoy Totally Killer. But if you uh, if you enjoyed Happy Death Day, I think this is going to be definitely uh, up your alley because I, I found it really entertaining. What did you think, Justin? Yeah, I would. Ag- I agree. I thought it was very entertaining. I mean, it's very light and fluffy and frothy. Although, I, I bizarrely, for something that's so kind of, I kind of influence. Obviously, there, there's Back to the Future influence, which they make much of in the movie, um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's so it's kind of more of a comedy than the slasher. But the slasher violence in it is as graphic as you would say you see in more one of the more recent Scream movies. So they don't shy away from the violence. It's quite graphic. The stabbings and stuff aren't like aren't glossed over. And you would imagine for a like a PG thirteen movie, they're kind of hard R violence in in a kind of a, in a comedy film, which is quite jarring in some ways. But it kind of it kind of works. I thought the lead in it was really funny and deadpan. And I did like like you. I think it really makes that that whole cu- culture clash of the late eighties to the modern era. And like she, and my favorite bit is when she, someone's wearing a t- t-shirt that says FBI and it says federal booby inspector. And she goes, Oh my God, that's so problematic. And so, but it, whereas it could be quite irksome that you'd be thinking it's uh, with that kind of gen X and Y or gen no X and Z kind of thing going on. It's treated in so kind of lightly and with such a wink that it's actually, you know, it's, it's really difficult to take it. Uh, to heart it's kind of it's just fun and frothy um but it's a good central mystery it's got some good twists throughout it and without going too much into it because obviously joseph hasn't seen the rest of it i kind of um really enjoyed it and it's it is funny to be thinking watching a movie that i don't know you thought eric but and what you thought seeing the beginning of it joseph it's got the budget of a big budget slasher movie or hollywood movie you know or a medium high budget for not an epic but it's certainly got a lot of money behind it and obviously amazon studios working with blumhouse um there i don't know what the budget was but it must have been in the high you know certainly in over 10 million i would have thought or something like that and it has that kind of high budget sheen to it i was wondering whilst watching it if it was ever intended for theatrical release because it does have Mm. that look to it as you said it was actually um they were supposed to release it on the same day as streaming like they did um during the pandemic but i think for whatever reason it just went straight to streaming um one thing I wanted to mention is that this whole, you know, this whole Blumhouse kind of Christopher Landon, Happy Death Day, freaky kind of thing. I enjoy it. The gimmicks, you know, they each have their own kind of gimmick. We got one coming out called It's a Wonderful Knife, where they um, basically this girl wishes she was never born. So she has to do the whole kind of Jimmy Stewart back in time thing to see why it would be better if she were born. And there's a mad slasher mixed up in this. So I think that's a great gimmick. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Christopher Landon or uh, maybe Christopher Landon. I can't remember if that's his name or not. But the director of Happy Death Day, uh, Happy Death Day, I think he's taking on the next Scream film. So I'm interested to see how that's going to pan out as well. Yeah, I heard that rumor. Well, it's a rumor. It's probably confirmed now. But yeah, that would be that would be interesting. Because they, they these films have a playfulness to them that's kind of missing from the the later scream sequels, I think. Yeah, 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 de- definitely. I mean, I think I kind of need to get around to reviewing the later scream sequels, and I think there's a reason why I haven't. And I I don't know if I'm um, there, there's there's a tendency at the moment with films to be getting more mean spirited now with the slash movies. It seems to be moving more away from popcorny to kind of more you know, terrifier style of things, which I enjoy terrifier and especially terrifier too, definitely was a, was a, a spectacle, um, you know, to watch. Uh, but those kind of, I kind of feel it's they, the, the screen films, all those screen films have always been brutal. They had a kind of lightness, a touch and a bit more playfulness to them. And it feels, although they're still ridiculous in the best way possible, they feels like that it's kind of moving towards slightly more cynical route 
Um, so, I, yeah, whereas the, the opposite, of course, Totally Killer is the complete opposite. It's the opposite of cynical, really. So, um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see where they take, um, take that and whether or not Neve Campbell uh, finally comes back. So, but yeah, I'd, I'd rec- I'm sure Eric would agree with me, but I'd recommend you watch the rest of um, uh, Totally Killer, Joseph, because it's certainly with that whole time time sort of switch or time travel thing, and it definitely plays into that. And also, the thing I liked about it, without giving too much away, is also how things are subtly changed in the future as it goes on, and how she's trying to stop things being changed too much. There's certain things she set out in the mind to try and stop, which is trying to stop her mother being killed and prevent the other murders and um but there's unintended consequences from that and that's part of the fun so it kind of reminds me of the the only other thing i was going to mention is i did i reviewed it for hysteria lives is one of the films i've been reviewing for october and um i did read that the uh, director of final girls which is kind of one of my favorite films of the last decade um threw shade at this film by saying haven't i already made this film um so because if you remember the final girls also has uh I, I you know a teenager going back into getting sucked into a slasher movie uh and trying to save her mother so kind of interesting comparison but then hey the slasher movies there's nothing new in the world so you know yeah i mean they i guess they're kind of similar but i they feel a lot different to me honestly i would agree i think there's enough difference there and it doesn't take anything away from the final girls um so um okay was anything else joseph that you've seen yeah, um, I'd mentioned this one on a previous show, but I hadn't finished it at the time. But I saw in full uh, Alone at Night via Hulu. And it's basically about a cam girl who finds herself stalked by a masked intruder. She's staying at a um, her, her friend's cabin after a breakup. Or, you know, or that's what the cover and plot synopsis would have you believe. She actually spends more time um, watching this fake reality show starring Paris Hilton. Which, uh, believe it or not, does tie into the plot. I, I won't tell you how that does that, but I couldn't even begin to remember how, honestly. Um, but there is a twist to it I actually thought was kind of clever. But I think this one tried to be much too clever for its own good. Um, the twist, like I said, with that reality show is pretty smart. But it didn't really add anything to the main storyline of this girl being stalked uh, by a masked intruder in her home. You know, it probably took from it, actually. So, you know, not really worth a recommend with that one. Have you guys seen this one? No. no. Is that a kind of Hulu or what is that on? Is that a... Yeah, it's 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 a Hulu original, I think. It looks, you know, it's got a, a high budget sheen to it and the actors are all good. But it, it's just really humorous because this girl, um, she's staying at this isolated cabin way out in the middle of nowhere. Yet she seems to have like a new visitor every five minutes. And it's always these people she she's never even met before. So she does the sensible thing and just lets them in. And, you know, she'll have long conversations with them or she'll get high with them. And when it comes to a couple of them, she, she ends up sleeping with them, I think. Um, and you'll tell one of them turns out to be a psychopath, but yeah, it's, it's not really what you'd think if you see this on Hulu. It's not. It doesn't really go in the direction I wanted it to. Or if if you're a slasher fan, it doesn't really quite go in that direction. But I will say it's probably worth a watch for that really weird um, Paris Hilton twist, which uh, kind of saves the film from being kind of completely forgettable into something. Hey, you should at least see once. So there's that. Okay, I've not seen seen that. I don't, Eric. You, I'm no, presuming haven't, you haven't. No. no. Okay. So, well, uh, forewarned is pre-armed, as they say. So uh, maybe on a rainy day. But uh, anything else, Joseph? Yeah, also on Hulu, I saw uh, No One Will Save You, which um, I I believe was all the rage a couple of weeks back. I mean, certainly everyone was talking about it. And uh, it's about this girl who lives on a farm, and she's kind of in self-isolation for reasons that kind of become clear throughout the movie. But she's essentially, um, she gets mixed up in a home invasion with an alien and, um, you know, this one starts well enough and manages to churn out some really effective suspense scenes. I mean, there's one involving a refrigerator door that had the hair on the back of my neck standing up. It was that good. But, you know, uh, like a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, elevated horror films, this one decides to kind of bypass those fun, cheap thrills that kind of make up the first half and it kind of goes for introspection during its back half 
You know, and I, I understand what they're trying to say here. Uh, there is a gimmick to this film where there's only one line of dialogue in the entire movie. Oh, um, really? Wow. Y- yeah, there's one line of dialogue last three seconds. So there's no talking in this movie. And it kind of ties in with, um, you know, why she's isolated and what it has to do with the alien invasion. But for me, it just felt like they were trying to be quiet. Like they didn't have, like they had plenty of reason to talk or to speak in some manner, but they didn't. So it just felt kind of phony. Um, but the action set pieces that make up the first half are really well done. The alien stuff, you know, uh, the, the CGI is a little dodgy in spots, but this ha- this is also has a really, really high budget to it that could go theatrical. So it all looks pretty good. It's when they decide to kind of, you know, get into the reasons why this girl's isolated that I kind of lost interest. But, you know, overall, this is definitely a movie I think you would like, Eric, more than I did. Um, but it's kind of a crowd pleaser, but it's kind of also one of those, um, you know, like I said, quote unquote, elevated horror films in the last half. But it's not quite as long as those films. So eh, marginal recommendation. Cool. So you've not seen that, Eric? No, not yet. No, I, I, I watched it and I kind of, I, I enjoyed, it's kind of one of those films, you know, sometimes you see a film and it confounds your expectations and you think you probably enjoy it more on the rewatch. It was kind of that basically, because the film, I don't want to give anything away, but the film starts very much that kind of alien invasion. Well, it's like an alien, it's, it's an alien invasion movie. And um, uh, you kind of get the um, the impression that's the way it's going to go. And it does, but it does in such a strange way. It starts off, I mean, there was there were bits in it I thought were really good. My favourite bit was the the bit on the, uh, the the bus when she's trying to get away. And it had that kind of It Follows feel to it, which I thought was very effective. Um, it's just without giving anything away, the, the last third of the movie just goes off in a, literally, it's kind of let me know when a spaceship lands type direction, um, at which I was kind of like, what the fuck am I watching? But I think in retrospect, I probably would, if I knew it was going to do that, I'd probably enjoy it more watching it because it's very well put together. Although I, it kind of jumps the shark a little bit, doesn't it? In the, in the middle section when you get like, you know, in Demons 2 when you get the baby, the, the, the dead kid or the zombie mm-hmm. kid running around with the big teeth, you kind of get a similar thing in this with like it's kind of um, baby alien. Um, so it was a little, little bit scrappy do for me perhaps there. But apart from that, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, it's like, I get what they were trying to say with the story as well and, and the way it ends. I, I actually think it's kind of clever, but I don't know. I just don't know if it mixes well with the, the first half of the film where I was kind of more into the kind of raw, raw hair raising thrills, which I, you know, if they could have sustained that kind of tension throughout the whole film, this would have been an instant classic. But, you know, it's just, uh, it's so middle of the road for me. I want to like it more than I do. Well, for, I'm going to message you, Joseph, to ask you about the ending, because the ending didn't make sense to me. And also I had questions about the ending of Totally Killer, which I'll email to, I'll send to Eric. So we can put our, put our heads together on that one. So, okay, cool. So Just any- don't send the wrong questions to the wrong person. <laughs> no, I'll try not to. <laughs> so, um, Joseph, anything else? Uh, just one more thing, and I'm not going to really get into too much detail uh, for this, but for the month of October... Um, I've made it a mission to rewatch all 93 episodes of Tales from the Crypt. Um, and as of this recording, I've gone through 14, so I still have a ways to go. Uh, but the good thing about Tales from the Crypt is they're all like 20 to 25 minutes long, so you get through them real quick. And it's it's been fun kind of rediscovering some of these episodes that I'd completely forgotten about. Um, yeah, it's been fun. Excellent. Okay. Right. Uh, well, it's a good undertaking for October, so... Always the month to be watching horror movies. So, Eric, have you been watching horror movies in the last... Uh... I have. I have a few to to regale us with. Okay, first of all, I saw The Nun 2. Oh. So this this mm. is the sequel to The Box Office Hit The Nun, and it's part of this uh, Conjuring universe. Um, and The Nun 2 has been getting more or less universally bad reviews, but it's done bonzo box office from what I can tell so expect a nun three on the horizon this one's set in a boarding school which unbeknownst to everyone who's occupying it uh, it plays host to a ancient relic that the demonic nun is anxious to get her hands on um so you know like with all of the conjuring universe films the you know there are, there are individual moments within the film that are really effective but the main problem for me with the nun two is that for the first two thirds or the first 75 minutes or so, 
you have the occasional jolt, but there isn't a huge amount of going on. I mean, it has likable characters, including two Irish characters. There we go. Uh, nice to see some Irish people in the film. But the, the plot is really threadbare. Um, and uh, my interest was, was just waning a lot all the way through the film. I think it's an hour and 50 minutes, probably. So, you know, a good chunk of that is just people walking around in the dark, you know, with not much happening. And then the finale goes to the complete opposite end of the scale and it gets too busy and chaotic. It, it kind of resembles a Marvel movie with lots of kind of flashing lights and lots of noise and CGI and things flying around and people being thrown in the air by an invisible force. Um, so, yeah, it goes from one extreme to the other and it just doesn't work as a whole. I mean, the nun is a genuinely creepy character. I think the, the look, the makeup and all that is really effective and in in quiet moments where you see the nun maybe just emerging from the darkness it's really quite creepy but when you have her sort of wailing and levitating in the air and things are flying all around her it sort of loses its impact but uh yeah so that's my tuppence on the nun too it's probably not probably not a recommendation did anyone see it no i kind of um i i didn't enjoy the first film very much because i thought it was just kind of basically a vomit of of um effects without any any substance which kind of um I, it was just kind of it was just a total overload for me and for me it was i don't know i know it's probably my age but i kind of for something like the nun i kind of want something to be a bit scary and a bit more kind of sinister and foreboding and having that slow burn um and the kind of creepy thrills but when it turns into like basically that one of those kind of like van helsing type you know for everything but the kitchen sink at it it just kind of for me i kind of zone out it's just white noise at the end of the day so yeah that's exactly what this is yeah yeah so so is this, is the sequel pretty much more of the same except it's kind of backloaded yeah it it for me it felt it, for me it felt like all all of the the vomiting and the, the van helsinging was all done in the final 30 minutes and then the sort of preceding 75 minutes were kind of dull right and it's and and it is kind of plotless as well. I mean, there's no meat to the story. None at all. None at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> wah, 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 wah. What about you, Joseph? Have you did you watch the original The Nun? No, I never saw The Nun. I was you know I'm completely aware of those movies and how they're all kind of mixed together. You know, like I've said a million times before, they all bleed together. They do, completely. I just don't really have much of an interest in that kind of film, if I'm honest. So I usually just avoid them. Yeah, although I would say that I, of all of that kind of Conjuring universe, I'd say The Nun was the one that mo- goes the most kind of um, uh, sort of um, Van Helsing by the end of it. None of the others are quite so over the top, I don't think. You know, so uh, and the Conjuring Two, I still think, is a good film. That was the one that was based on the Enfield hauntings. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, well, I, it's to be honest, it's going to be a rainy Sunday movie, uh, under, Sunday afternoon movie for me. But I'm not, I'm not particularly uh, excited to check it out. So, uh, but thank you, Eric. Any anything else? Yes, I saw Talk to Me, which is this much um, lauded. Have you seen this one? I have. Yes. Yeah. Now. I thought it was quite good, but to hark back to Joseph's review of No One Will Save You, this is kind of pushing towards being elevated horror as well. It, it's very much in the same mood as something like It Follows or Smile from uh, last year, in that it's kind of that curse horror movie. So the, the premise is kind of like Ouija or Lights Out or Truth or Dare, but it adds this kind of, I suppose, slot slight elevated horror approach um you know so there's a lot of emphasis on the 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 main characters in this one it's an australian movie but it feels very american you know apart from the accents uh the setup is there's this mysterious hand that supposedly belongs to a, a medium or a you know a clairvoyant and it's used by this gang of young folk to communicate with the dead they have these kind of parties where you hold the the hand and you say talk to me and then you'll start seeing the spirits of the dead and if you say invite i invite you in they will possess your soul and uh, the rule is you, they can possess your soul for 90 seconds after that you're in uh, you're going to be in trouble so uh, you know they, they have these parties but they only allow themselves to be possessed for 90 seconds at a time so this leads to a brilliant sequence in the midway through the film where the the younger brother character gets possessed and uh, he goes over the 90 seconds and it 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 leads to mayhem and it all goes horribly wrong um 
but and you know I loved the uh, the, the the kind of seancey party scenes, but in the second half of the film, it ditches that much like you were saying with "No One Will Save You," um, uh, Joseph. It, it kind of sort of focuses on the main character and uh, her kind of struggles and the, the them trying to um, revive a family member who's in sort of a, a, a coma in hospital. Uh, it is entertaining and I did like it. I couldn't help but feel it was slightly overrated because it, it arrived, you know, with so such glowing reviews that I was like, possibly expecting more. Oh, and uh, one thing I read about this film on uh, as on Wikipedia was that it's it's banned in Kuwait because one of the actors in it is transgender. Now, the character they're playing is never referred to as a transgender character and you could ha- happily watch this film without knowing that fact. Uh, but for some reason, the people in Kuwait have an issue with it. So, but which is so ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, um, I did you see talk to me, Joseph? Actually, I did. I saw about half of it. You know, kind of like totally killer. Um, what I saw of it, it seemed to me to be like it follows or smile. Um, maybe a little, I don't know, trying to be classier version of that. Um. You know, again, I'm not really into those types of movies that much as, you know, as, as like I am with the uh, uh, the straightforward slasher film. So I, I will re- I will watch the rest of it, but I'm not re- in a real hurry. Hmm. I kind of really liked it. I did enjoy it. I thought it was um, it was quite refreshing. In there, there were kind of things in it that you wouldn't necessarily see in an American movie, like the toe sucking scene, for instance. So things like that, as disgusting as it was, it was kind of like, well, that's not something you'd normally see in like an American genre movie. So it had that kind of weird, that kind of weird quirkiness to it. Um, uh, it kind of lost me a little bit towards the end. It's kind of, it's quite often, it's a lot of these movies when they, they start off, start off, it's like the conjuring movies we talked about and they start off with this. You don't know what the, it is. The insidious movies, perhaps a better example. You're not exactly sure what's behind it. When you actually find out in the, like in the insidious movies, it's people stood around with, um, in bad lighting with funny makeup on it's like is that it is that really what the other is or whatever it is the upside down or wherever it is in that movie i can't remember so in this the it kind of the fervor that was the one um so in this movie it's kind of when it got into it started getting to the more surreal and kind of stuff towards the end when you actually kind of see what's beyond that fourth wall what's beyond the you know it kind of uh it had again it had those kind of glimpses reminding me of um uh, it follows with those glimpses of what the dead were and what connect the connections they made, and those kind of short, sharp shocks of those kind of um, recently dead corpses or whatever they were was quite jarring. It's just when it got into that slightly more fantasy based stuff towards the end, it kind of it kind of lost it for me in some ways. But having said overall, I think it was a pretty good movie, and I thought there were some quite frightening passages in it. So, um, but uh, yes, and anything else, Eric? Yeah, just I'll, I'll quickly gloss over this, I promise, because we've been talking too long already, I know. Uh, I got the latest uh, Jello box set from Vinegar Syndrome. It's called Forgotten Jolly Volume 5. So I've watched all three. So the first one was Tropic of Cancer, which is was weird, uh, but weird in a way that didn't entertain me. I, I found it kind of, it dragged a lot. The second one was The White Dress for Marielle which was more much more fun has the world's strangest banquet sequence in the middle um it has to be seen to be believed and there's a bit of chubby eye candy in it for me too who goes around with his shirt off for most of the film um but that's not a reason to recommend it well it is but um the last one i in the box set is called nine guests for a crime and that's the one that i liked the most it's set in an island it's kind of 10 little indians uh this family sort of congregation an island and somebody's offing them one by one it plays very much like a more conventional old federal massacre too <laughs> <laughs> yeah that and five dollars for an august moon is, is the kind of the film it's like but it's more it's 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 the lay it's the freshest Jallo in the box set because it's from 1977, so it has a a later 70s feel, which I really like. Um, uh, it, you know, because there's, there's amazing flares to be seen in this film. Um, of those, um, of those three films, are, are, is there any daily bread dialogue? There's no daily bread dialogue, I'm afraid. No. Aww. But um, if you want daily bread dialogue, I know that the Antichrist, which is also known as the Tempter, a 1974 possession movie, is coming out on Blu-ray soon. So that has plenty of of that kind of dialogue, and it has the lead actress uh, rimming a goat. 
<laughs> well, as part of a satanic ritual. Uh, not something you see every day, thankfully. No. no. <laughs> okay, so that's have you have you seen any of those Jallo, uh, Justin? Tropic of Cancer, a white dress for Marielle, and nine guests for a crime. Uh, I have seen Tropic of Cancer uh, many years ago. I don't think I reviewed it for the site. I saw it on a really bad bootleg. So I don't remember a huge amount about it, but from Anita Strindberg's in it, isn't she? Yeah, and there's a lot, just a pre-warning if you're going to watch it again, is there's a lot of slaughterhouse footage in it of cattle being slaughtered, um, which is unpleasant. Yeah, I am. Yeah, no, I've not seen that. The The last one sounds kind of interesting, so um, um, I, I will kind of catch up with that. So uh, thank you, Eric. I mean, talking of... Um, uh, Jali that Vinegar Syndrome put out. I really, I've done done a bit of a blitz on History Lives at the moment, just doing trying trying to do a review a day for October, but I don't know if that's going to happen. But so far, I've managed it. But one of them was five five um, five five no five uh, for the women no um, five murders. No, oh, I know it. Can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> <laughs> Killer. Mm. Five hell, star, go to the beach. <laughs> no, what's it called? It's five murders for the killer. No, five women for the killer. That was it. Five women for the killer. Stelvia Massey, who did um, Arabella Black Angel, which is the one we've we've covered, which was the the one with the um, uh, the completely insane nineteen eighty nine Jallo with uh, with dildos and all sorts of things. So this one is kind of a similar kind of feel to it. So it's not quite as out there, although it is pretty bad taste because it's a killer who's um targeting recently pregnant women and cutting them as the coroner says from the clitoris to the sternum so as you can imagine it's not the most good taste of uh, movies but otherwise it's very much like an argento style black glove killer um, and it ends with a babysitter being menaced around a house with a classically dressed jello villain with an axe so it kind of brings to mind sort of preempts the slasher movie a bit so um, so if you want any more of these, I mean, information on these, these are on Hysteria Live. So I'll just run through a few more. Um, I watched, I'm um, on a bit of an international slasher kick at the moment. So um, a couple that stand out was the Japanese doll from 2019, which uh, is a Japanese slasher and the um, about a group of teenagers who uh, allured to an American style um, summer camp, which I didn't realize in Japan, they have all these American style Friday the 13th summer camps all across Japan where you can go to learn English and have a summer camp. Um, and it's as if you're in New, New Hampshire or something, or New, you know, so it's quite freaky. But anyway, these um, teenagers are attacked by someone who's dressed as a giant, giant bobble-headed Japanese doll in a kimono who goes around killing them with barbecue instruments and axes and chainsaws. Um so that one was, and, and you know that visage just sounds ridiculous, but when you see it, it's really kind of freaky looking. Um, that's one of the reasons why I want to see this movie because the killer looks so kind of. It's very jarring. It's got that girls' night out quality to it. Yeah, it's kind of one of the ones we talked about. How it's kind of the the killer will have absolutely no peripheral vision whatsoever. So running through the woods after a teenager with a chainsaw is a is a tricky proposition. If you're kind of wearing this massive bobblehead, um, but, anyway, but you said there's some good chase scenes in it, didn't you? Yeah, there are some good chase scenes in it. So it's uh, yeah, it's quite an effective. It's very much um, out of all the Japanese slashes I've ever seen. This is the most American style slasher movie. Um, although it does feature kind of um, uh, you know talks about a curse or they're kind of bringing to mind all the Jew and the Grudge and the Ring, uh, those kind of things. So they, it still has a little bit of that kind of Japanese folklore in it, but. Uh, but that was good. The the other a couple of the other ones I'll just quickly mention is uh, Tuna Negro, which is a Spanish slasher from two thousand and one, um, which um, is translates as when I looked at Tuno or Tuna is in Spanish. It refers to kind of like a minstrel or a, a traveling minstrel, uh, and it's in Spanish. The uh, another type is Black Serenade. Um, so a uh, university in Salamanca in uh, in Spain. Um, there's a serial killer who dresses as the black minstrel, which is kind of a garb that most of the boys wear uh, during hazing, um, a tradition that goes back many centuries, and kills all the stu- well, kills three students uh, with the worst grades in university, uh, and then comes back the next year and um, makes contact with a group of students, and they have to try and find out who the killer is. So uh, another masked slasher, um, very much based, uh, very probably influenced mostly by urban legend, I would say. Um, but that's uh, that's definitely one. That's a that's a fun one as well. 
Um, the other two, just quickly, one was the Cinderella, which is a Thai slasher from 2011, um, which has the uh, which is about a uh, an act, a bratty actor who kind of does a kind of strops a bit like an Imagineric might do on a set, um, <gasps> and then has an accident and then ends up dying, and then comes back. Or does he? But somebody comes back in his skin. It's either him being um, brought back to life through black, black magic or someone's wearing his skin. And he goes back to the film set and starts killing everyone off one by one. Um, and so it's kind of, you imagine Leatherface, but in this case, it's a whole body Leatherface, like an Ed Gein style um, thing. So that's that's pretty entertaining. And the last one I mentioned is Bladaren, which is the Swedish slasher from 1983 which is one I've wanted to see for years and years and years and never got around to it. It is, um, it is pretty terrible, but it's quite en- quite endearingly bad. Um, it's about a rock group called the Rock Cats, an all-female uh, rock band in spandex and big hair who break down on the way to a concert and end up in an abandoned village uh, and then get stalked by a killer called the Bleeder who bleeds from his eyes when he gets excited. So it is ridiculous. There are, there are bits in it when the girls talk about um, being ch- stopping moose chasing them by farting at them and things like that. So it is ridiculous, but it's from 1983. It's got spandex, big hair. Um, someone's saving themselves by firing a Polaroid camera's flash in the killer's face and a killer trying to eat a Rubik's Cube. So there's quite he tries a lot of stuff to eat to a Rubik's Cube, is that what he said? Well, he kind of bites into it, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's my, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen any of those, but Darren, I know Joseph, you saw that back in the day, didn't you? Yeah, it got a very, very limited, uh, low budget release here as the bleeder, um, uh, on VHS way back in the nineties. Um, it was a very rare tape. I saw it once and stupidly decided not to buy it, but, um, yeah, it's, it's really terrible. It's kind of shot on video ish. It looks like it might have been shot on low quality film and sped up. Maybe I don't know. I think it was. It was shot on on video. It was the first shot on video um, horror film. Well, it's the first ever Swedish slasher movie, and it's the first shot on. It's got because it, there's always kind of who did do the first um, shot on video horror movie because the Blood Cult. They were saying the first shot on movie slasher movie or whatever shot on video. Sorry, slasher movie, and that was released in 1985. And Blood Aaron was 83, and I think Sledgehammer was 83, wasn't it? Yeah, and Boarding House was 82, so, mm-hmm. I mean, everyone owes a debt to Boarding House, whether they like it or not. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the the Bleeder or uh, Blotterin or whatever you want to call it, um, it's not bad. It, it, it kind of has that sort of, that kind of doom asylum energy going for it, it in does. a way. Yeah. 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 So, um, but anyway, if you want any more information on, on any of those, there's reviews all up on Hysteria Live, so do check it out. Um, okay. So, uh, should we move on to our main feature, finally? That was a lot of recently seen. That was. And, and Nathan wasn't even here. Exactly. Wow. wow. So, I have, um, I'll play the it's a TV spot for Psycho 3. Yes, it is, yeah. The guy just wants to be left alone in peace. Aren't you going to take him in for questioning or anything? Just leave him alone. Norman, is that you? Yes, Mother. It's me. Psycho 3, rated R. Now at select theatres. Check newspapers. The Bates Motel is once again the site of something evil as the rehabilitated Norman attempts to help a disturbed young woman, Maureen Coyle, who has left the convent because she can't find any proof that God exists. Maureen bears a striking resemblance to one-time Bates Motel guest Marion Crane, which puts Norman on edge. At the same time, a nosy reporter is snooping around town looking into Norman's past. Suspense, terror and black comedy worthy of the master himself are in hearty supply in the most shocking psycho of them all. Um, Psycho 3... Uh, well, I suppose 1983's Psycho 2 surprised many people in that it wasn't pants. I think a lot of people were expecting it to be utter tripe, but they were, t- they were kind of taken aback that Richard Franklin had made a really decent film. Um, three years later, in 1986, we have Psycho 3 and Anthony Perkins here. Uh, Norman Bates himself picks up the reins to direct uh, this second sequel, and I think he does 
a pretty good job too. I mean, the plot starts in a manner that reminded me a lot of the very recent Halloween ends. You have this suicidal nun played by Diana Scarwood, who um, is about to throw herself from a bell tower and ends up accidentally causing a fellow nun to fall to her death. Um, and she's told she'll burn in hell for this uh, as she escapes to the, into the wilderness and is picked up by the sleazy Jeff Fahey, who is playing um, Duke or Dwayne, I think is his actual name. Uh, and they both end up at the Bates Motel then where a series of new murders begin to take place, including one to poor uh, Juliet Cummins, who uh, was uh, also in Friday the 13th, The New Beginning and Slumber Party Massacre 2. And she didn't su- survive any of those films and she had to get her top off in all of them as well. Um, so the events of this film take place a month after the end of Psycho 2. So people are still looking for Emma Spool. So this is a sp- Spoiler for Psycho 2 if you haven't seen it, but uh, we found out at the end of Psycho 2 that Emma Spool was really Norman's mother, or was she? Um, and uh, he clobbers her over the head with a shovel uh, at the end of the previous film. That's, that's where we kind of pick up things here. Um, but uh, yeah, so Norman has the body of Emma Spool upstairs in the bedroom in a rocking chair decomposing and she is the new mother and she's barking orders at Norman and she uses the whore word a lot which makes me think she's possibly related to Daniela or maybe Magdalena <laughs> um, or to you yeah oh how rude <laughs> one thing I noticed well, in early on in this film what a girly gas <laughs> it was and he's like oh. bullying I've known Norman I've known Norman I've known Nathan to prepare to defend me. <laughs> anyway, uh-huh. one thing I noticed early on in this film, there's a close-up of a newspaper, which is um, an article on the the misses on the missing uh, Emma Spool. But um, I was watching this, and I, you know, projected on a big screen, and I was looking at the text for the article, and it's all about. Um, uh, residents feeling they have been taken advantage of ever since the tax laws governing their additional land holdings were reviewed and increased. And that kind of paragraph is repeated over and over again and also in accompanying uh, articles in this newspaper as well. Now that is shoddy prop work right there. Could they not have written <laughs> up a fake story? Um, uh but no, I do. I really enjoy this film. There's a real off kilter feel to a lot of it. I mean, the excommunicated nun angle is certainly original. Uh, and the scene where she hallucinates the Virgin Mary rescuing her as she lies dying in the bath uh, as, as she attempts to uh, commit suicide is is really bizarre also. Um, mixed in with this are kind of more traditional slasher elements. Uh, you know, like I said, Juliet Cummings is in this film. Um, she gets killed in a phone booth and the way she struggles, uh, she's, she's putting on her sweater uh, and sort of halfway with the sweater still over her face, she's attacked by this killer with a knife and it reminded me of a, a similar scene in Tenebrae. Um, and the, the, I don't know if, if it's my memory playing tricks at me, but this film feels a lot bloodier than Psycho 2. So I can't, you know, maybe I need to rewatch Psycho 2, but this one felt a lot more slasherific. You know, there's a scene where Kat Shea is playing a character who's on the loo and she gets her throat slit and it's, it's quite bloody and eff- very effective. Um, also, I can't let the press... Could have used some more plops, though. <laughs> Could Yeah, there wasn't enough plopping. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> ladies do plop, though, do they? I'm sure they do. Okay. Um, speaking of Cat Shea, I can't let it uh, go past without mentioning her um, friend in the film, who's played by Donovan Scott. He plays this character called Kyle. Now, he only has uh, 60 seconds of screen time, really, but um, yeah, he's steals the, sh- steals the film. Oh, Eric, I knew, I th- when I was watching it, I knew you'd be like, is that when she starts saying, he's saying, you can play with my baton? Yep. So to quote um, uh, Lana in Friday the 13th, The New Beginning, he is so hot. Um, Anyway, uh, I also like the plot thread where Norman feels he's found that kind of kindred spirit in Maureen. You know, both of these mother issues, it's his, for him, it's his mother. For her, it's a kind of mother superior, I suppose. Um, It all ends in tears, obviously, because this is a psycho film. Uh, There's a great scene where um a dead body is in the ice um bucket no it's not a bucket it's a big what do you call those things it's an ice chest ice chest there we go um 
yeah, which must cost a fortune to run because it looks quite it's quite a hot place wherever this is set. Um, and the sheriff uh, opens the ice chest and he's picking out some ice, completely oblivious to the fact that there's a dead hand sticking out of it and there's blood on some of the ice cubes that he's about to put into his mouth. Uh, I thought that was a great scene. I do recall seeing that that. Uh, scene from the film on film 86 I'm guessing it was with Barry Norman back in the day um, yeah so Di- Diana Scarwood's character possibly is a bit unsympathetic because uh, she's so dour and downbeat all through the film and, and I think her character is quite um, melodramatic uh, her few upbeat moments revolve around her waxing lyrical about her religious visions uh, you know and she comes across like she's away with the fairies a bit like Justin is. <laughs> you said I didn't do a girly gasp. <gasps> hey, I didn't. That wasn't a girly gasp, was it? That one I just did. Oh, it might have been. No? Yes, that was quite a. Nothing no, against, nothing against manly. girls, but. Hmm, okay. What about this one? <gasps> That's a man. You're starting to sound like girly man, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rainier Wolf Castle. Um. <laughs> Uh, but not like, like yeah. As I said, she's she's possibly unsympathetic. She's an interesting character, but unsympathetic. Norman is is probably the most interesting character still. Uh, you know, obviously in the Psycho series, um, there's some lovely touches. Like there's a there's a scene at the start where he is doing some taxidermy on some birds, which I think he's deliberately poisoned. Has he? Because we see them falling from the bird table as after eating some seed. That's um, the impression I got, yes. So yes. hopefully they didn't um, harm the birds. That's what I was wondering, because it looks too realistic for a 1986 film. Um, um, but he's doing some taxidermy on the birds. He's using a spoon to put whatever taxidermists put into animal carcasses. But then he uses the same spoon for, is it peanut butter or something? Um which is uh, well, this was a studio film in 1986. They would have had animal practices in you would place like to at think that so, time, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I like there's, there's a scene at the end where he is. Uh, I think he's kind of in full on psycho mode, but he's walking up the stairs towards somebody as if he's going to kill them. And in the middle of the pursuit, he takes time out to straighten a crooked picture, which I thought was kind of fun as well. Um, so despite his villainy, though, he's still. I think he's still a really I suppose likable character you'd have to say a kind of a sympathetic character um, but yeah overall Psycho 3 I think I don't think people hate Psycho 3 I think it does get kind of get forgotten though is my impression but I really really do enjoy it I think it's it's a nice companion piece to Psycho 2 Psycho 4 is where I kind of begin to lose interest but maybe I just need to rewatch that one again but for me it's a thumbs up for Psycho 3 so what did you think Joseph? Man, you know, I enjoy Psycho 3, but I remember enjoying it much more back in the video store days than I did this time around. I think it pales in comparison to the first two, if I'm honest. Um, To start, I kind of like the idea or the insinuation that this time we'll have a look at what it takes for Norman Bates to have a love life, which, um, you know, I believe would have been the, the the most natural progression of his character up until now. But, you know, instead, we, we more or less follow story beats that, that were already covered in the first two films. I mean, we know this time exactly who is dressed as mother. And, of course, we already know why. So there's no real surprises. And the fact that they decide to hide uh, mother's identity just seemed like a waste of time considering it was so obvious who who was doing it. Uh, The new characters, I think they just kind of stand around waiting to die. Like Jeff Fahey as Dwayne, I mean, he should be more of a dastardly presence in Norman's life. Instead, he just kind of stands around looking shifty until until he finally decides to blackmail Norman at easily the worst time. Um, the uh, the runaway girl who, who may or may not be falling in love with Norman, she's kind of pretty much there to just kind of occasionally look worried and then call to mind the Arbogast character from the first film. Only I think the visual gag isn't as effective this time around. I don't know. I mean, this all feels like that everyone got to the table and had a read through of the script and didn't ask any questions as to why 
you know, why everyone's doing the same thing again. And, you know, and I get it. Slasher movies can be repetitive. But when you you have a character like Norman who kind of begets a kind of introspection, maybe it's better if we don't go for the same old questions that, you know, have been asked and answered a dozen times before. And I think, you know, for me, Psycho 3's best bits are when, you know, Norman gets to be shifty. Uh, you know, in and around the hotel and hide the bodies on the premises. Like you said, I love the scene with the the body in the ice chest and the cop is rifling through there to get ice on a hot day and he picks up the one with all that's covered in blood. I mean, that's some great bits of comedy there. Um, but you know, the the bits with Norman, you know, it, it's been done. You know, I, I I didn't learn anything new about Norman. I didn't learn anything new about you know why he's still at this hotel. I mean, nothing really changed. I mean, it's just all kind of static. It's well-made static, but I don't know. I just, I prefer the first two. I wasn't as impressed with this film as I remembered being. So kind of a thumb sideways for me. Mm. Justin, what are your thoughts? Well, as I mentioned, this was a first time watch for me. I mean, if I have seen it back in the day, I would have been probably blind drunk and don't remember it. I, I, but I was watching it and thinking, I just don't think I've ever seen this before. So again, I, it's one of those movies I just presumed I'd seen, but I don't think I had. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was different enough from obviously part one, obviously in part two, even though it's kind of a direct sequel in the same way. Whereas, um, you know, because it is literally only a month or less than a month, isn't it, from the events of part two. Um, so when they're trying to find, uh, you know, Norman's, well, what turns out, you know, spoiler alert, arguably not to be Norman's mother. But um, so I, I, but the thing I did appreciate about this, I think it worked as a kind of a slasher movie. I was surprised actually how slasherific the the deaths were, especially the the murder on the toilet, uh, the toilet with Cache with the the you know the who has a slit throat, which wouldn't looked out of a place in a Friday the Thirteenth movie, which is something when we get onto some of the critical reviews of it at the time, we're comparing it to the Friday the Thirteenth movies. Um, but for me, it's kind of the black humour kind of really shone through and of course Hitchcock is you know all his movies were kind of shot through with black humor um which arguably I kind of guess I say I haven't seen Halloween sorry Psycho 2 for a little while but I kind of get a feeling that that kind of humor wasn't that humor was um, pulled back a little bit of Psycho 2 um but it's um is I'd see Psycho 2 as a kind of a black comedy it's almost uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 compared to a Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1 uh, but not as batshit as that. But certainly it has that kind of satirical black humour about it. I mean, there's all sorts of things like Norman saying, um, uh, the Diana Scarwood character saying, oh, I'm sorry, I left the bathroom in a real mess. And he's saying, Norman saying, I've seen worse. Um, all those kind of things. The other thing that made me laugh, and I'm sure I presumed it was unintentional until I realised the whole thing was kind of playing as a black comedy, is the um, the beginning scene where Diana Scarwood's at the top of that tower where she's threatening to throw herself off um, because she says, I don't believe in God anymore. And the nuns are trying to talk her down. And some of them are being quite, you know, basically shouting at her. Um, and uh, one of them says, you cunt. And um, I think she meant you you can't, but it sounded like mm-hmm. she said you cunt, which is a bit like... You in can't the, face the, Maria. <laughs> well, exactly. What What is you can't face Maria in The Sound of Music? And it just made me laugh because I'm juvenile like that. But um, so I don't know if it was setting that. And then, of course, you had that kind of um, tribute to Hitchcock's Vertigo when the nun falls down the tower. Uh, so um, obviously it's quite, a, it's quite a dangerous game to play for Anthony Perkins to, to do that, to be... Uh, basically sort of uh, I, you, you can't escape the shadow of Hitchcock with a psycho movie you just can't so he kind of takes it kind of head on um, um, but I kind of enjoyed it I mean Jeff Fahey, uh, his character is probably the sweatiest character I think I've ever seen in a horror movie or slasher <laughs> movie I mean by the end uh, when he's in that room when um, he uh, he kind of basically steals the corpse of Norman's might be mother and puts it in his own room, and he's just kind of glistening. He's kind of like someone who's been in the sweat box for four days. You can literally smell him. Um, it's so it, it has that kind of feeling, hey, that kind of griminess to watch it. Watch the guitar. <laughs> watch the guitar. No, and he gets beaten to death. Well, it doesn't quite get beaten to death with a guitar. I mean, there is. I can know what you're saying, Joseph. I mean, there's lots of visual references back to the original movie. I mean, the whole thing with Jeff Fahey's character getting pushed into the lake is obviously referenced to him, the Marion Kane character ending up in the lake 
of the first one. So there was lots of referencing to that. I thought the thing with um, Norman, and one of the things Anthony Perkins said about this movie um, compared to the others was that he intended it for you to go backstage with Norman. So for you to see him, his kind of day-to-day activity almost. So uh, not exactly normalising him. But um, you, I think you mentioned, Eric, about saying about how Norman Bates is pretty sympathetic. I mean, even in the first Psycho, he is a very sympathetic character. Uh, and uh, you'll sympathise with him in the second one because you don't know what's going on and why that he's seeing these things. And this one, you know he is doing it. He's dri- been driven by his mother. Um, I did think it's the, the, the scene with Diana Scarwood and the, uh, when she Norman goes to kill her when she's in the bathtub. Uh, dressed as mother and he pulls back the curtain and she's cut, already cut her wrists in the bathtub and then as you mentioned see, he, she sees him as the Virgin Mary um, is quite um, it, it really is quite a striking image and for me it was kind of I don't know whether or not what um, kind of faith uh, if if um, Anthony Perkins had any faith but it felt to me like there was like a commentary on like religious delusion going on with that so I thought that was quite interesting that kind of that kind of whole thing of turning that around from the, the shower murder to uh, Norman actually saving someone. Um, but it doesn't stop him then going out and killing these other women and other people in the film. So, uh, yeah, I kind of enjoyed it. I enjoyed the character, the kind of sassy um, uh, journalist who's trying to find out, um, get to the bottom of the, of the truth about Norman and her showdown with him at the end, which goes not goes exactly where you think it's going to go. Uh, I, it, and it ends. The film ends with that kind of, kind of pretty much that kind of shot. Not exactly shot for shot, but certainly referencing the end of the first movie with Norman heading back to the asylum, but holding the um, the severed head hand of his dead mother. Uh, so it's kind of a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't for this film. That in the same way as a Friday Thirteenth film demands certain things, I think a psycho film also demands them, just like a. A Nightmare on Elm Street film or whatever demands it, but there is a, obviously a case of diminishing returns to some degree. Having said that, I kind of I did enjoy this. I thought it was it it was kind of on the right side. It was kind of it kind of had that budget sheen of a studio movie, but it definitely pushed those kind of slight sleaze and kind of exploitation buttons as well. So I yeah I enjoyed it more than I thought it was going to actually, if I'm honest. Mm, excellent uh, and I'm sure Nathan probably enjoys Psycho 3 as well <laughs> yes, if, I'm sure to make, if I'm to make a prediction Y'all's turn <laughs> <laughs> okay anything else to be said on Scream 3 or shall we go on to background Psycho 3 what did I say Scream 3 you said Scream 3 alright oh, because we're doing Fango flashback and there's a Scream 3 um, is on the cover of the Fango we're covering this month that's why I'm getting all confused Psycho Eric, 3 that's, that's my job to get things mixed up. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Do we have anything else to say on Psycho 3? No, it would be interesting to see um, uh, Psycho 4, the beginning. So um, oh, the only other thing I was going to mention was that obviously where, nor, um, which kind of leads into feedback, I won't go too much into it, but Anthony Perkins is interesting because sort of, you know, obviously as an actor, he'd been acting a long time before Psycho, well, a relatively long time before Psycho. And he was known for those kind of boys next door, kind of geeky, kind of love interest kind of roles, kind of lighter roles. So, um, but if any character outside of, you know, maybe Jamie Lee Curtis or someone like has, was typecast as a horror movie sort of icon that Norman Bates was. And it was interesting that he kind of came back to, um, apparently he'd through ever since the success of Psycho and all the knockoffs of Psycho that came from that through the 1960s. And obviously the shockwaves felt, through the seventies and beyond, was that he sort of said that he kind of resisted the calls to come back to to Norman Bates' character. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting that he did come back to it. But also looking at what else he was doing around this time, um, because he kind of uh, he had that kind of shtick going on, and whether or not he wanted it or not, was that uh, he was in like the that kind of really trashy, um, fun kind of semi slash movie of Destroyer. Um, set in the prison, one of those kind of 80s prison movies. Yeah, and he also did um, e- Edge of Sanity, where he did like a Jekyll and Hyde type thing. And like you know, like you said, he he came back and he came back as Norman, and I think that opened the floodgates for him in the 80s, especially to kind of 
do that kind of sinister role again. He, be, I mean, he became kind of like the Vincent Price of his era in a way. Yeah, no, no, it's, it was interesting, and I kind of, I, it's clearly that he's having fun with the character, isn't he? Um, and I, I do. That's one of my favorite shots. I think you mentioned to Eric because when he's coming up the stairs, dressed as mother, chasing that journalist in the house, and he straightens that picture. Yeah. Has little touches like that are just so, uh, so good and so clever. And the fact that I don't think think this is his first film he directed, wasn't it? I don't think I he's think done so, anything yeah. else. Mm. Um, and uh, I, you know, I want to just mention it before we go. Well, we are going to background. I can guess was that I read an interview with him. He said I, he didn't go to film school. He, he said it's too late to go to film school. He picked up a book on directing before he did this film, which I thought was quite a, a you know quite an admission. Well, I'm sure he learned stuff from being on movie sets for so long as well. Well, he actually said, he said, I, I saw this interview with him, uh, the press junket around the time Psycho 3 came out, and he's, they asked him about that. And he said, well, to be honest, as soon as I was finished, I was, I was so young and so not interested, I would just go outside and top, my tam, uh, top up my tan in between <laughs> takes. So, you know, yeah. you would have thought. Except, except yeah. for the films he made in Ireland, if he made any in Ireland. Would he made any? I'm sorry, I'm not getting that reference, Eric. Uh, he wouldn't be topping up his tan if he was making oh, a see, film in right. Ireland. Yeah, yes. yeah, fair enough. I get it now. So, so yeah, background. So, Joseph, what do you have for us? Do you have anything? Not a lot of background for me, but I do have a copy of the OG press kit that they gave to critics before their screenings of Psycho 3. Um, it basically just kind of gives the standard information about the actors and the director and since Anthony Perkins is kind of pulling double or maybe even triple or quadruple duties in Psycho 3, there's a lot of mention of him in here and about his approach to the material and more or less how he landed the uh, the directorial duties. And it's got one little interesting bit with a crew member recalling uh, Perkins as a director. He says... Uh, Tony may have been a first-time director, but when he took on Psycho 3, he came in with a background and experience that few directors ever get in a lifetime in his 35 years on stage, in motion pictures and television, as an actor, a stage director, and a writer. All the important things that directors spend a lifetime learning became ingrained in Tony Perkins as an integral part of his life. So he was more than up for the task of taking on Psycho 3. And uh, yes, this was his first directorial uh, gig, and he read the script and liked the script so much that he felt that he w really wanted to direct it. So uh, yeah, there's that. But that's all, that's really all the background I have. I just wanted to kind of you know brag that I have that press kit. I actually have the physical copy here. Oh, um, we can hear you yeah. turning a page. That could be a phone directory, though. No, I don't have any phone directories. I wish I did. It's not 1985 like anymore, in there. is it? Yeah. No. <laughs> You'd have to get into that time machine from Totally Killer to find a uh, phone directory these that's days. That's true. Yeah, mm. that's true. Uh, Justin, do you have any background? Yeah, I've got a couple of um, uh, con uh, clippets, or clippets, is that the right word? Snippets of uh, contemporary reviews. But also there was, uh, I dug up an interview with uh, Anthony Perkins on the kind of press junket for Psycho 3. So I'll just read a couple of bits from that, which I think are quite illuminating. Uh, he says, you know, Psycho 2, for all its excellent qualities, is not an obsessive film. It has a laid-back quality, and it's too long. 20, 20 minutes longer than the picture, uh, than this picture. Before I started filming, I timed the screenplay with a split second. I didn't want to shoot too much, and, have to, and have, then have to cut it out and leave loose ends. And then have a fifteen-year-old skateboarder say, "Skateboarder say, I must have had a longer scene there once." Um, he says, talking about of Norman. He says, "I wasn't trying to make him scary, but scared." What I like about the whole approach to Psycho Three is that it provides us with a unique opportunity to go backstage with Norman Bates. We know sometimes he does his mother's bidding, but lots of time he doesn't. He obeys her, but he hates her. I have a lot of affection for Norman and a lot of sympathy. So does the audience. I think he's not just a mon monster; he's tortured. The real secret of the Psycho movies is that they are tragedies first and horror movies second, which I thought was kind of interesting to see where he was coming from with that. Um, understand, well, predictably, the reviews at the time were kind of, they'd been begrudgingly um, uh, positive for Richard Franklin's Psycho 2, which at the time when it came out was seen as complete heresy or sacrilege. Um, uh, you know, it was kind of, it was like making Citizen Kane 2 or, 
or a Casablanca or something like that. It was seen as, you know, or the culmination of everything that was wrong with the 80s horror movie. Um, so uh, I think they were begrudgingly um, sort of, uh, sort of when that came out, it was actually a pretty good film. I think they were surprised. But um, not so much this time. Chicago Tribune, which, of course, um, I think was uh, Siskel or Ebert's rag, um, uh, led with third time around, Psycho 3 has lost all of its charm. It said uh, part two was a conventional thriller, but part three had um, Norman hacking away at times as if he was Jason from the Friday the 13th series. Um, uh, The Arizona Daily Star said directing yourself in a movie must be like being Norman Bates. You're following the comments of your own disembodied voice and hoping that your other half knows what you're doing. And lastly, Michael Wilmington in the LA Times said Psycho 3 is better in more respects uh, than part two. It has some good writing and better than good acting and directing and, uh, and writing. Uh, but ultimately said fails any sequel's acid test. It feeds off the original without deepening it. Sequelitis takes over and the movie collapses into Friday the 13th. So they had a bit of a bee in their bonnet about Friday the, Friday the 13th, which I kind of guess was kind of, um, for us, isn't a problem. Um, but it kind of falls, it kind of uh, feeds into what you were saying, Joseph, wasn't it? That, um, the feeling that being there done that and not really um, cutting any new ground or making any new ground with, with the movie. Yeah. And you know, that, that works in a Friday the 13th film because I don't know, it has that kind of popcorn familiarity to it. And when in psycho, you know, there's a progression I think needed for Norman Bates and we don't really get that here. Mm. Can I just, before we finish, just cause I know we obviously always spoil the movies normally and just want to just a quick talking point because i want to see if i can clear it up because obviously it's first time watch for me is the the um i can't remember what the actress's name but the the woman who plays the reporter challenges uh norman bates and says that uh the woman who's claimed to be his mother in part two was in fact his aunt was that meant to be that the woman the original mother was his mother yes yes um, okay. on the commentary track on the blu-ray it is by the uh guy who did the screenplay who is james uh, charles edward pogue he says that the thing he hated most about psycho 2 was this plot about emma spool being norman's real mother so his intention with this script from the outset was to undo that plot point right okay so that's clear thank you that is yeah no, that's it for me yes okay um I only have, I only have a few things now. There is there's a couple of extras on the Blu-ray, but none of them are really that illuminating. But uh, Diana Scarwood's bare bottom nude scenes were performed by Brink Stevens, who I know is beloved of uh, Young Nathan. If he was here, he could wax lyrical about it. Yeah, so she did the body doubling. Uh, Steve Miner was offered to direct Psycho Three, but he turned it down. I, he was doing probably Soul Man, I suppose, around the same time as this. The budget was eight point four million. But it- <laughs> Boy, I bet he wished he would have taken on Psycho Three now. <laughs> yeah, Soul Man hasn't aged well, has it? That's another thing that <laughs> you know you go back in time to nineteen eighty six. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, the budget was eight point four million. It only made fourteen point four million at the box office, which is probably why I think Psycho Four went straight to video. Did it? I believe it did. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it um, debuted at number eight in the box office, which is really bad. I mean, the number one box office attraction that weekend was Karate Kid 2, which was number one in its third week. I am the man who will <laughs> fight. fight for your honor. And there's a bit of Joseph Satira there. Um, <laughs> yeah. It opened the same weekend as The Great Mouse Detective, About Last Night, Under the Cherry Moon, and Big Trouble in Little China. Now, it did beat all of those new releases in the chart, but it still only debuted at number eight, which is kind of not a great chart position to have for a big major blockbuster movie. Um, Cat Shea. It beat out Big Trouble in Little China? Yeah, Big Trouble in Little China debuted at number 12. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's painful to hear. Yeah. Um... Kat Shea, of course, who plays the woman on toilet in this. I'm sure her character has a name. I can't think what it is off the top of my head. But she, um, of course, we would know her as a director. She made Strip to Kill, which we've covered on the podcast, uh, one and two. Uh, She did Carry to the Rage. She did Poison Ivy. Uh, She says on the extras that she really had to sit in a tub of ice for that scene with the, you know, the sheriff and that. Um, She said that Anthony Perkins didn't want to use fake ice. He wanted to make it look as realistic as possible. So she had to like be, you know, 
uh, encased in ice for a whole day or two. Um, so it seems that, very unlikely, especially as all you see is a hand. This is it. That's what I would have thought. And of course, Diana Scarwood was in one of Justin's favorite films. Justin, course, M- Mommy Dearest. Yeah. Yes, mm. she was the daughter. Yeah, Christina Crawford. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's really all the the background I have. I'm afraid. That's okay. One one thing I did want to mention we haven't mentioned was the music, um, because I I think Anthony Perkins wanted uh, had a specific well, specifically wanted the music not to be that kind of orchestral. Uh, there's there's bits in it I thought were actually some of the the music, especially the um, near the beginning, which I thought were really clever. Where there was um, uh, I think the scene actually when Norman goes into the diner the first time, there's bits where the music plays as if it's a record skipping, which kind of amps up the tension a bit. But uh, the um, but otherwise the music is kind of very much more 1986, isn't it? And in fact, I think they actually even talked about um, saying they wanted to have some pop songs on there that could be marketable for the MTV generation. Oh, so uh, some Toya. Well, it wasn't. No, it wasn't Toya. But uh, so it's, well, I was looking at um, uh, Nathan's favourite um, uh, encyclopedia of Wikipedia. Uh, I can throw the shade because he's not here. Is hmm. that it says that um, uh, that the composer uh, Burwell, who was Burwell, Carter Burwell, uh, was approached by Perkins to do the do the score um, because he'd enjoyed his work on Blood Simple um, and said he wanted a, more of a kind of contemporary uh, um, score compared to that kind of. Uh, the, I think Jerry Goldsmith had done the score for Psycho Two, um, so it says here that he performed. Um, uh, composed and performed songs with colleagues Stanton Miranda and Steve Bray um, but uh, Universal claimed the songs weren't sufficiently bankable so apparently tried to create a song of Oingo Boingo front man so um, but apparently uh, using sample strings from the original Psycho score but that was rejected so it could have been an interesting movie because going back to Total Killer the uh, that whole thing of those kind of watching a film from set the year after this is made and it had things like um, uh, uh, the uh, Venus by Bananarama the, the kind of the cover version and The Killing Moon by Echo and the Bunnymen so I, so we ne- very nearly had a Psycho 3 kind of filled with 80s pop songs which would have been strange oh yeah um, well I kind of when the, when they sang about Bankable <gasps> <laughs> Rude. Uh, two other things I had in background actually that I took a note of when I was listening to the commentary well sort of listening to the commentary on the Blu-ray uh, the original script had Meg Tilly set to return now she's killed at the end of Psycho 2 isn't she I think what he meant is that she's going to come back and play a kind of lookalike he, she's supposed to come back and play a psychiatrist in part 3 but that was axed that um, idea also the early version of the script had Jeff Fahey as the killer Okay. Well, I kind of wonder if they were, you know, at the time thinking, you know, s- s- seeing what had happened with the Friday the 13th movies and at this time um, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. So it's Nightmare on Elm Street. When did it hit its kind of mother load of uh, kind of most popular, didn't it? Or probably, well, it's part four. 1987. Most, yeah. 87. But, so, with Dream Warriors, yeah, in 87. So I imagine the people behind this may have been thinking, hmm, maybe we can get a franchise going here, which of course they did to some degree. Um but uh, yeah, so the, maybe that was the reason why they just they were thinking about going with Jeff Fahey as the kind of as a kind of like almost having a, every Psycho movie having a different person framing Norman Bates. But obviously they decided not to go with that, which I'm kind of glad to some degree that they didn't. And just out of interest, did you any of you guys watch Bates Motel, the TV show? Mm, I saw the first episode or two. Yeah. Mm. I the, the well, there's there's a. Are you talking about the recent one? Well, relatively recent. What from about seven or eight years ago? Oh maybe? yeah, I, I saw I saw the whole thing. Um, I I quite enjoyed it. Um, a lot of people disliked the final season, but I thought it was kind of fantastic. Honestly, um, it took some interesting twists on the original Psycho yeah. formula, so I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I don't think I watched the final season. Actually, I think I can. We watched the first two seasons, but I quite enjoyed it. So. But um, but yeah, so I mean, the Psycho Legacy. Um, we obviously had the the kind of um, fast, uh, Guy Van Sant's remake doing in nineteen ninety eight. The kind of shot for shot. Gus Van Sant. Gus Van Sant. Sorry, yes, Gus Van Sant uh, remake with um, uh, who was in it? 
that was Vin, uh, what's his name um Vince Vaughn Vince Vaughn mm-hmm. and um and Hesh was it and Hesh of course and that was kind of a bit of a well I mean that was a bit of a core celebrity at the time but it was a bit of a damp squib wasn't it <laughs> just to try to remember names it's always I'm terrible hilarious. Yeah. I've got it written down um <laughs> but uh so I mean a psycho at the moment where is the psycho kind of film series is it's kind of moribund really isn't it I think so yeah yeah I mean, honestly, without Anthony Perkins, what can you do with Psycho? Yeah, well, fair enough. So, okay, what was the consensus on the group on this one? I'm, I'm curious, Joseph. Well, we had 30 comments overall for Psycho 3. That's pretty good. Uh, Killian H. Gore writes, Love it. I still remember being drawn to the poster art for this when it came out. That tagline was so perfect. It was great to see how Anthony Perkins had grown to embrace the role so much to the point of directing the movie, too. Psycho 3 actually features quite heavily at the end of my upcoming novel, The Horror Movie Massacre. That's from Killian H. Gore, who is a fantastic uh, writer, by the way. Um, And Luke Barossa says, After Psycho 2 surprised me with an interesting continuation of Norman's story, 3 felt like a weak entry. I've watched it twice, and I doubt I'll get the urge to watch it again. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all that we're doing. Listen on Amazon, Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, and about a billion other podcatchers. Both good and terrible. Join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month to help support the show. Or if you're financially inclined, select a tier that fits your budget for that extra monthly bonus content. That's patreon.com forward slash the hysteria continues. All one word. And that goes for our email address as well. The hysteria continues at gmail.com. Over to you, Justin Kurzweil. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> like a newsroom. It was like a newsroom. Um, so uh, what should, where should we go next? Feedback. Feedback, yes. We've got some feedback, haven't we? So, Eric, do you want to go first? Yes. Um, this is from Alyssa Kaloya. And she says, hello, Hysteria Continues. First of all, I want to say how much I enjoy your podcast. I found you guys through Vinegar Syndrome's Madman Blu-ray. And after listening for the past few years, my list of movies to watch has now gotten 10 times larger. Just like my belly. Um, <laughs> that was that was my aside. Not, that's not Alyssa speaking. That was me. Sorry. Uh, second, I went to a screening of the first three Sleepaway Camp films at the Mahoning Drive-In in Pennsylvania this last weekend. The first is one of my favourite movies of all time, but at this point I hadn't seen the other two in about a decade. I forgot how much I actually enjoyed the second. I'm not a fan of talkative killers in slashers, but Angela is my one exception. I think her cheeriness makes her very unsettling, doubly so when that mask slips in some parts. As for the third movie, after having listened to your podcast and re-watching the movie, Sorry, but I agree with Nathan on this one. It might not be as good as the first two, but I still enjoy watching it. Cindy's flagpole death got a big cheer from the audience, and Angela just resigning herself to kill over the slightest inconvenience was pretty entertaining. Anyway, keep up keep up the great work on the podcast. I look forward to your commentaries on future Blu-rays as well. And that's from Alyssa Kaloya. Thank you, well, Alyssa. Thank, thank you, Alyssa. Did we do... Yeah. Th- I know we... The Madman commentary, did we do that for Vinegar Syndrome or did they get that from... We did it for... We did it for somebody and that was used in another territory as well, wasn't it? I think it was Vinegar Syndrome. Okay. Because that's the one that had... Um, we had uh, Johnny Krug with us as a guest, I believe. Oh, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was Vinegar Syndrome. I don't know if anyone else picked it up. They may have. I think I you're. Know. I think you're right. Actually, it was used twice, wasn't it? And I can't remember which mm. way round it was. I don't know if it was Arrow. God, it's going back in the mist of time. Yes, back in so, the mist of time. Back in the mist of time. But thank you, Alyssa. So thank, thank, thanks to getting in touch. And obviously, shame uh, Nathan isn't here to hear your uh, kind words about his yes. uh, his tastes. So, but um, I'm sure he'll find out. We'll let him know. So thank you. Um, so I have a shorter one here, and there is a longer one that Nathan had uh, from uh, Wes Ray. So you'll have to wait for next time, Wes. We haven't forgotten you. Um, or do you want but, me to read this out? I don't mind. Okay. Well. Okay. Well. Yeah. We could do that. So um, 
So I've got a short one here, not literally, but um, <laughs> say I've been listening to you guys for years now and still have no fucking idea what Eric is singing in his joke of the week jingle. It's my joke of the week. It's oh so brilliant and fantastic. Ah, well, there you go. Because I couldn't say it's brilliant and fantastic because that doesn't rhyme with week. Ah, OK. So I had to change it to fantastic, like cine fantastic. Well, there you go. Well, that probably answers the rest of uh, this short message. So should I leave it as one of life's little mysteries? I presume whatever it is will be as witty as the joke themselves, which, you're, yes, you're quite right there. Uh, still listening, still loving you all long time, Simon Logan. <gasps> <laughs> Simon Dot Logan. Yeah, Simon Dot Logan, yes. So, well, hopefully that, that mystery has been cleared up for you now. And uh, as you can see, it is as witty as Eric's joke <gasps> of the weeks. Hmm. You'll be so, laughing on the other side of your face when you hear my joke. Oh, wow. Well, yes. Well, let's, well, let's, um, well, anyway, we've got a little bit of time until we get that, thankfully. So would you yeah. want to read the, yeah. the other one from Wes? This is one from Wes Ray, and I really like the, what uh, Wes has to say here. He says, hey, gang, great episode on Final Destination 2. I have a very weird but interesting and kind of gross bit of background that wasn't mentioned in the episode. Around the time of the movie's release, I was scouring movie news and rumour sites daily, reading everything I could online about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, Final Destination 2, Freddy vs. Jason and pretty much any other horror movie of that era. One such site had an interview with one of the practical special effects crew members of Final Destination 2, and in the in the interview he went into great detail about the gory bits that were used inside the exploding body that is hit by the falling pane of glass. He told the interviewer that, and I'm paraphrasing here, I even added some brown goo to the torso cavity so that when it exploded there would be a bit of poop flying out from the body. He then added I'm paraphrasing again I don't think you'd be able to notice the poop on camera but at least I would know it's in there. Pretty wild huh? Somewhere among all the blood guts and grew in that scene is a bit of brown poop. You sure don't get that dedication to realism with CGI? Now, you may be wondering why I'm paraphrasing. Well, despite my best efforts to locate the actual interview before writing you, unfortunately, I cannot find it anywhere. It appears to have been completely lost to time. Ain't it cool news, Dark Horizons, Chud and Bloody Disgusting were among sites I frequented at the time, but all my searches have come up empty. I can't even remember the effects guy's name, but that titbit of pure movie magic has always stuck with me. I know what you're thinking, but I swear I'm not making this up. Anyway, take care, and if any of you or any of your listeners out there have any luck locating that agent interview, please let me know. And that's from Wes Ray. So there. It's always well, nice to get some ploppy um, yes. trivia. Yeah. Could you imagine? So if only that guy had been working on Friday 13th Part 3. <laughs> or Part 5. Or Part 5, yes. And can you imagine if they put in the sound effects with that kid getting crushed as well, like plop sound effects, like plop, plop. Oof. Yes. Well, enough scatological humour. Let's um. Yes. <laughs> let's uh. Let's go for something not funny. It's my joke of the week. It's so so pretty and fantastic. Did you know that Diana Scarwood's character in Psycho Three was a chain smoker? Yes, indeed. She used to be on 40 a day, but she's recently ditched the habit. Ditched the habit. Because she's a nun. Because she's a nun. She wears a mm-hmm. habit. A habit is that thing that a nun wears. <laughs> well, none is the okay. amount of, none, none is the amount of laughs that got, Eric. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> so... <laughs> God, the same old, we've got the uh, same old stick going. How many years is it now? 13, 14? Gosh, yes. Never gets old. So what are we, um, let's find out what we're covering next time. Oh, oh God, yes. Uh, we are, well, it's Halloween season and we're out of Halloween films to talk about other than um, we do have a Halloween 2 fan commentary coming out on Patreon. So if you're not a Patreon subscriber, go there and you can hear us wax intellectual over the wig in Halloween 2. But anyway, um, Nathan's going to like this one. That's probably the only reason I'm choosing this is because it is a Halloween film we haven't covered. And Nathan likes it, and I can't think of any other reason why I would pick it, but it's 1982's Trick or Treats. Which I have never seen. Yeah, well, um, 
you're in for it, buddy. <laughs> I I'm not sure if I have seen it actually because um, uh, my friend Gino <laughs> recorded. Uh, covered, sorry, um, did a uh, review on History of Lives many years ago. So I uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see it. If um, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to it in a thinking, trying to think uh, positive thoughts. Mm, keep thinking keep thinking so well yeah join us next time so like this october obviously a very halloween based um month of course and the halloween 2 commentary we're very much looking forward to that's going to be a lot of fun um but obviously as much as we wish we could be covering halloween 2 again for for the main show we can be doing trick or treats instead but i'm sure that'll be fun one so uh join us for that um and eric what are we playing out with um, I just picked a random a psycho type song, so I chose one I like actually, Killer in the Home by Adam and the Ants from their classic 1980 album, Kings of the Wild Frontier. Excellent. I picked up on vinyl not that long ago. Good choice. So, okay, we'll play out with that. So, uh, yes, hopefully, well, we'll no, Nathan will be back next time. Um, and you've been listening to The History Continues. So, thank you for listening and say goodbye to the good people. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.